going out first. Well, good morning, and what a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord. Good morning. We've been learning about the church. What is the church? When we look at the very beginning of time, even, from the very beginning, God wanted to have a relationship with man, and he always had his people. Thank you, Lord. And when we go back to Israelites and the Hebrews and Abraham, God always had a called out people. So you go back to the book of John, I think it's chapter 17, which is prayer. He wanted a people that was in the world, but not of this world. He wanted one that was completely separated from this world and serving him wholeheartedly. And as we travel home, we see that's exactly what the church is. Too many churches today, they live like the world, they act like the world, and there's no separation. But that is not the church that God has called out. Right. We know there will be many on that day that say, Lord, Lord, right. have I not done this? Have I not done that? Mm -hmm. And they may have done that, but they did not have a relationship with God. And because of that, they'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. These are people that were in the world, and they were of the world. But that is not the church that God is looking for. He is looking for a church that is in the world to be God's hands extended. We are the light of the hill. God is looking for our people to be a light in the midst of darkness. Yes, and the darker the time, the brighter the light. And we are living in a very, very dark time. Yes. And we are to be that light. We talk about the creation of the church. And who is the foundation or the founding stone of the church? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Who are the foundational blocks that make up the church? Do you remember? The apostles and the prophets. But the Bible states that it is a lively stone. So it's not that you just have this building and when the roof is on, that's it. But rather the church of Christ is constantly growing. So it's built upon Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone, the stone which gives direction to every other block that's laid in the foundation. Upon that we have the apostles and the prophets. And upon them are us. And like I said, we are to be lively stones. And as lively stones, that means the church is to be constantly growing. It's not completed until Jesus Christ comes back and calls us home. But until that time, we are constantly growing and working for the kingdom. We talked about the purpose of the church, to edify the saints, to educate the saints, but also to evangelize the lost. And then we started talking about the gifts that Christ has given to the church. What are some of the gifts that Christ has given to the church that are specifically mentioned in Scripture? We've gone through several of them already. And he gave some... Exactly. Ephesians 4 and verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Once again, as a side note, going back, keep in mind as we're reading Ephesians 4 11, there is the office of the teacher, but the pastor, the person who has the office of a pastor, is also supposed to be a teacher. There in Ephesians 4 11, there is no semicolon separating it. It says pastors and teachers. Then if someone would please read 1 Corinthians 12, 28. This is the verse that we've been focusing on for the second half of the gifts study. First Corinthians 12, 28. It's also at the top of the notes. And I said some of the church first apostles, secondary prophets, So we've gone through apostles, prophets, teachers. Today we're going to be talking about that of miracles. Now, take notice that this of healing are going to be the next lesson we go through. So when we're talking about miracles, we're going to be shying away from resurrection of the dead and healings because we'll be talking about that next week. But today we're talking about the gift of or the office of one who has miracles. When we look at the Greek word used for miracles, it is the Greek word, and anybody want to take a guess? We've heard it before in preaching and teaching. Dunamis. And when we talk about dunamis, what word normally is associated with it? 
Uh, whatever is being preached, we always talk about the dunamis. Power. Power! We don't talk about much of anything else. We always talk about the power aspect of it. When we look at the King James Version of the Bible, well, should, let me back up. That Greek word dunamis means this. Force, literally or figuratively. Especially. Miraculous power, usually by implication. A miracle itself. Ability, abundance, meaning, might, worker of miracles, power, strength, violence, mighty, in, in parentheses. Uh, not in parentheses, but uh, I'm losing my mind this morning. Anyhow, right there it is, special denotation. Uh, uh, wonderful works. So we get that idea of power behind it. Force. Something out of the ordinary. It takes you off guard. When we look at the King James Version of the Bible, that Greek word dunamis was translated power, mighty works, wonderful works, the power, the powers, of power, virtue, a miracle, by miracles, the miracles, mighty miracles, works of miracles, the meaning, the strength, strength, their power. I do have their in, theirs in italics, and the reason for that in the notes is because that's one of the words the King James translators italicized to show us that they inserted it there. Might, the powers, the violence, and the abundance. So every time we're looking at that word dunamis, it's not passive in any way. Did you get that, that uh, connotation in any way that when we use that word dunamis, that it's just laying back, it's relaxed, and it's just doing whatever it can, stay away from me? No. We get the idea that it's out there, it's putting itself out there, it's forced, it's powerful, it's mighty. If we use the word dunamis, it's almost uh, like that word alive. The word of the Lord is alive, quick. It's powerful. We get the idea that it's constantly out there. It's not just laying back somewhere. It's not just passing. But there is something specific and there's something definite going to happen. And everyone's going to take notice to it. When we look at the Greek word dunamis and all the times it was translated in the Bible, more times than not, it was connected with power, performing, miraculous, performing the miraculous, including mighty works, or even giving or even given authority. When I say given authority, I go back to Jesus sending out the 70. He is the only one that definitely had all power and might to give authority into anybody to do anything. And those 70 went out healing the sick, casting out demons. They did mighty, powerful works. What would you call that? If we had to use a Greek word, we call that dunamis. They did great and mighty things. They did things that made them astonished. They came back saying, Lord, we've done this, we have done that, and we've done this. So when we look at this, it's an action, it's a doing, it's something that's powerful. It's not just, I'm going to work every day, but it's something bringing it out of the ordinary. It's something that makes you stand up and say, hey, you are not going to believe what just happened. So every time we look in the King James translation of the Bible, we would follow that Greek word dunamis. More times or not, it would be associated with power, something powerful happening, some great and mighty work, some great and mighty miracle that Jesus was doing, what the disciples were doing. It's not laying back, just taking a rest, but it's something that makes you, not just others, but it makes you stand up and pay attention to that. Wow, I cannot believe that that just happened. So doom has come with great power. Now, where does this power come from? Where does this dunamis power come from? Does it come out of the thin air? Is it the Holy Ghost within us? It is the Holy Ghost within us. And even, I'd go even a little bit farther, not, not to lower in any way or suppress the meaning of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but when we go back to the 70 that went out, they didn't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But the Holy Ghost was with them. When we talk about the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is God being on my presence. He is everywhere at one time. He is the one that does the work. When 
when we talk about the Godhead, we always talk about the doer, that is the Holy Ghost. Because even when Jesus Christ was on this earth, he had all power, he had all authority, but it was the Holy Ghost working through him. The Bible states that, the, that Jesus Christ was given the Holy Ghost without measure. What does that mean? That means when he was healing the sick, when he was raising the dead, when the woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of his garment, it wasn't necessarily Jesus himself healing her, but it was the working of the Holy Ghost through Jesus to perform these actions. So the Holy Ghost does not, we don't have to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost to perform great and mighty works. We really don't. If we are living right, if we are doing what we're supposed to, Jesus did not say that only those that have the power of the, that have the baptism of the Holy Ghost greater things than these shall I do. That was promised to every believer. So any believer, as long as we are following the word of God to a T, they can perform mighty actions. There have been Catholics that have been able to cast out demons. And they may not have been living right. How were they able to do it? Because they were using the word of God. The word of God is quick and powerful. Now, if you go back over some of these accounts, unfortunately, over time, you'll find that the Catholic priests that were involved in the exorcism, if you want to use their terminology, they ended up dead, they ended up dying, they ended up killing themselves, whatever it was. Why? Because they were not living right, and that demon that got cast out was probably coming and tormenting them, and they were trying to get away from it. Or if he brought, that demon brought something into their life. That does not neglect the fact that they used the word of God to cast them out and they were able to do it. And I'm using that from the example that they were not saved, they didn't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So focusing on, you don't need the baptism of the Holy Ghost to work miracles, but there are promises in the word of God that as believers, he's given us power. He's given us power to trample over scorpions and serpents. He's given us power to raise the dead. He's given us power to heal the sick. That is a promise to the believer. You do not need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, why wouldn't you want the baptism of the Holy Ghost is another story and a whole other topic. But God has given power to the believers through the Holy Ghost. Even just throw one more out there. The Bible does not say that if you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you shall lay hands on the sick and see them recover. He didn't say, only take them to the elders that have the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the prayer of faith shall save them. You know, there are certain things that are promised to the believer. Jesus said, greater works than these shall ye do. And that was given to absolutely every single believer. Thank you. And that is what we're talking about today. Now, I want to, now if you get down to it, anybody that has a baptism, you know that there's more power that comes with baptism as you pray in tongues, as you build yourself up, as you build your relationship with God. But mighty works, power, those are things, gifts, that God has given to every single believer. Now there are some believers that have the gift of miracle. That falls, I won't, wouldn't classify it as one of the nine gifts, but it is kind of an office. There have been men, if we go into that, um, and especially our Pentecostal past, we know that we're, during the great healing revivals, our church name comes out of one of them, A.A. Allen. We go back to the healing revival of Jack Coe. There was another man, I can't remember, that he went around healing, coming hands on the sick, and they were recovering. Now, there was a night when he got old, and he stood up and said that he was at the pinnacle of his ministry, which you know there was a sickness that took him out. But power is given to each and every believer. But at the same time, in the background of our mind, we need to keep in mind that today we are talking about someone that has the gift of miracles. Someone that practices it in their lives. But this is all, I should say, the office is for everybody, but the promise is for everybody. If that makes sense. Because God, Jesus Christ said, greater works than these shall ye do. He didn't say only a hand select a few. He said ye. He said you. He said all of us. If you believe on Jesus Christ, greater works than these shall you do. And when we look at Stephen, I'm hoping it's in Acts chapter 6. Give me a moment. I should have marked it down. I did. Acts 6, 8. Is that, you got it, brother? 
Yes, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. That's exactly what I was looking at. And what did that verse say? And Stephen, full of faith and uh, power. Where did his power come from? Lord Jesus Christ. And the Holy Ghost. So when we look at the early church, we see early believers that actually had the power of follow -up. And we can talk about others too. Um, like I said, we'll talk about healings next week. But Peter and John go into the temple. Power is exhibited right then and there. And it was a power that wasn't just, well, I'll heal this man and make a change in his life. But the Holy Ghost was making a statement to everybody there because even the lead religious leaders didn't know what to do with it. They said we could try to scare them not to speak in the name of Jesus. But see, God uses signs and wonders to verify his people. If somebody ever comes against you, you know, God just might use signs and wonders to make them step back. They won't know what to say. I'm not saying that they'll say that you're a child of God or a minute, but God will make a way. In the book of Romans, there's a verse, and it's talking about evangelism, but we're going to use it in this context too, that every mouth must be stopped. So God will always verify his people. He will always verify his messenger. There have been at least one person I can think of at work that came against me, trying to get me fired. You know where he is now? He's not at work. Shortly after that, he was high-tailing the animal there because he was about to get fired. God will always verify his messenger. God will always prove that he's you know, that you are his people. But he's also looking for people that are not afraid to go out and do signs and wonders. Because we are living in a very relaxed time when it comes to the church. We really are. And we and society tells us that if you say anything about homosexuality, you're performing a hate crime, yada, yada, yada. It doesn't matter. But when God gets in the mix, that makes all the difference. Well, we're not afraid to stand for God because you know what the society is trying to do for, to the true church right now, what the devil's trying to do? He's trying to make us shut our mouths. Because when we shut our mouths, we're not of any threat to them. When we come every week, and we don't go and lay hands on the sick. When we go and we aren't looking for people to talk to about Christ and win them for Christ. When we don't see people on the street and say, you know what? God can provide for that need. Let us pray. When all we're doing is sitting, we're no threat to the devil. And look at the world and what's going on around us. We talk about our own country that maybe if only the church would have voted, we could do more. If only the church would get behind and do more. If only more people would stand up for this instead of keeping their mouth shut because the minority is saying that is a hate crime. That's a hate crime. And all this other interrogational threats and everything else. We're just sitting here. Are we praying for our nation? Are we trying to do anything for the kingdom of God? You know, God's not looking for a church that just sits back and does nothing. If he was, God, Christ would have never have given us power to go and heal the sick. He would have never given us power to talk to each to others and tell them about Christ. Uh, tell them about him. He would never have given us power to raise up the dead and heal the sick. He wouldn't give us power like he did with Stephen. The Bible says that he was a man full of faith and of what? Power. The reason he was full of power is because he was full of faith. Where is our faith at? I know that's a side topic, but you know, with power comes faith. I have all these things and stuff I want to do for the kingdom of God. I might be the greatest visionary in the world, but if I don't have the faith to back it up, man, I'm never going to see anything accomplished. And the only reason things get accomplished in the first place is because of faith and because of the Holy Ghost. He is the one that makes things happen. But Stephen was a man full of faith and of power. And we have no idea all the things that Stephen did in his lifetime. They're not recorded. Just like there are so many things that Jesus Christ did in his lifetime that would have been considered mighty works, that would have been great works. But the Bible says that volumes couldn't contain all the stuff that Jesus did. And if we're supposed to do greater things, that same dunamis, that same power, follows every single Christian that is a true Christian. But what are we doing with it? Voltaire once said, with great power comes great responsibility. We're lacking in the responsibility aspect of it. We're lacking in the responsibility department. If you've been given something and you're expected to do something with it, and all you do is let it sit on the shelf, that's not great responsibility. If you're expected to do something and you just sit there 
staring at the wall. Well, you're not being responsible with it. Because we've been given great power. What are we doing with it? The church is just sitting on their hands doing nothing, while the devil, who knows that his time is short, is out there actively working. I read an article that stated that the reason that most people, uh, most of the millennials are taking up witchcraft is because it makes them feel like they have power in their own hands to take control of their life to some degree. Because in a world where it seems like everything's falling apart, it's the only place that they can find it. Where's the church? We're the ones with the true power. We're the ones that know the true God. We're the one that knows where the true path is. But yet we're letting them deceive. And to a degree, we ourselves are deceived. And we would only open our eyes do we realize how much witchcraft really truly goes on in America. And it's right in front of us on a daily basis. Whether it's television, whether it's video games, whether it's uh, radio, music. It's all right out there for them. The internet makes everything so handy for young kids to get a hold of anymore. What are we doing to battle it? What are we doing to counterbalance it? And that's all they see and they say, oh wow, if I worship the devil or I do this, man, something's going to happen. Well, what if we showed them about who God is and let God work through us for a change? What if we got out of our hands and said, you know what, God? I am nothing. I realize that. But you said greater things than these shall ye do, Lord. Let me prove to this world that you are alive and sitting on the throne and that you have more power than the devil will ever have at his fingertips. You are. He may come in the book of Revelation and make it look like the beast came back to death, but you are the resurrection and you are the life. If only we would get a hold of who God is and the power that comes through the Holy Ghost, not because of who we are, but saying, Lord, I am a willing vessel. I dump all of myself out at the altar. Fill me with the Holy Ghost. Fill me with faith. Fill me with power that mighty works may follow me. And let me be like those in Acts chapter 16 where the world took notice and said, These are they that turn the world upside down. I think it's about time that there's enough people in the church that raise up and say, God, let me have this power that follows. Let me not just, I know I have it, but let me exhibit it. Let it work through me. And let's turn this world right side back up. But we need to be willing. We can see this power listed in Mark chapter 16, 17, and 18. What does Mark 16, 17, and 18 state? These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. Shall they cast out devils? They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Is there anywhere in that passage that said only those that have the baptism of the Holy Ghost? No, it said, all them that, that believe, it is to every believer. You shall speak in new tongues. You shall take up scorpions. You shall take, excuse me, take up serpents. You shall do great and mighty works. In other words, what Jesus Christ is saying here, I'm the one that has all right to give authority to you. Now it's time for you to take up the dunamis and go. I am giving you the dunamis. I am giving you the power. And before that, we see in Luke chapter, and we won't turn there because there's 20 verses, but Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 20. We already talked about that this morning already. Jesus gathered 70 disciples, sent them out in pairs, and they came back, and what did they say? The Lord, devils are subject to us. The devils are subject to us. Said, Lord, we've done this and we've done that. You wouldn't believe the stuff that we saw. In fact, if we went to step back a little bit and look at it from a third per, uh, person perspective, if we were sitting outside looking in, you can almost sense the amazement in their voice. Lord, the devils are subject to us. What is that? These people, did they have the baptism of the Holy Ghost? No, it wasn't given yet. But all of this power was given to those that believed. And said, Lord, even the spells are subject to us. And Jesus had to reroute them. No, that's great. But rejoice that your names are written down in heaven. Amen. We've been rejoicing that our names are written down in heaven. But what have we been doing in the meantime? All we've been doing.
doing is rejoicing. We don't go out and try and cast out devils for the sake of casting out devils to say, oh, I've done this. We don't go out and lay hands on the sick to see them healed so we can say, oh, I've done that. We rejoice that our name is written down in heaven, but we are battling a real enemy, and we realize that time is short. And saying, you know what? The devil, you realize that your time is short, but I also realize that my time is short. James said that life is but a vapor. It's like grass and it withers away. And Jesus Christ can come back at any moment. Between those two conditions, the fact that I could die at any moment and the fact that Jesus Christ can come back at any moment, man, I need to pick myself up by the bootstrap and I need to do something for the kingdom of God. I'm rejoicing that my name is written down in heaven, but you know what? I want to take everyone with me that I can. And I want to show those people out there who is the true living God. And I want to see those yokes of, yokes of bondage broken. I want to see those drug addictions broken. That they may be set free and come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That they may as well rejoice that their name is written down in heaven. The dunamis has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with him. And we need to go forth, come to battle, conquering. Because Christ has given us all power through the Holy Ghost to do these things. But the church all the while is sitting on the hands. What are we doing with this power? And we look at the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 16. At the very beginning of the chapter, Paul is in Corinth. And he's going to, I think it was, no, Philippi. Philippi. And he's going to the river to pray. Why is he going to the river to pray? Because apparently at that time in Philippi there was no church. So the early Christians would meet by the river to hallow church. So today we're going to pray. And every day, Brother Eli, there was a soothsayer, this young girl, whether you want to call her soothsayer, oracle, fortune teller, it makes no difference. They're all the same. But every day as Paul was going to pray, she came out and made fun of him. These men are the most high God. And she wasn't doing it to recognize who they were or the place and position in Christ. But she was making fun of them. She was heckling them. Until one day, Paul had enough. He was going to pray. And the Bible says he commanded that evil spirit to come out of her. And it came out within the same hour. Does the Bible say anywhere that Paul stayed there, laid hands on her, and prayed with her in a Pentecostal fashion? We've all been there probably. We know what I'm talking about. People praying hard on the The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that he stayed there at all. It doesn't say that he went away either. But perhaps all Paul did was say, you know what? In the name of Jesus, come out of her and turn around and kept going on his way to pray. And within the same hour. Now, why was Paul able to do that either way? Because greater things than these shall you do. Miracles. Power shall follow them that believe. It's been given to every single one of us. I go to Acts chapter 28, 1 through 6. If someone would please read that. Acts 28, 1 through 6. Do you have that one as well, brother? Go ahead and read it, please. And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled the fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he had escaped to sea, yet vengeance had suffered not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. So when we look at this passage, a snake came out of the woods and let by all fire or a pile of wood and bit Paul. And all he did was shake it off. Did Paul know that the snake was poisonous? Maybe, maybe not. But we do see that God used it to prove who Paul was in him. That he was truly a man of God, and that God is the true God, and there's no other God. What did that verse say that Mom read earlier? Do 
you shall take up snakes and they shall not harm thee. I know, I'm paraphrasing. I'm not talking about Jojo, um, Joel, West Virginia, where they handle the say, snakes. But when we look at Paul, it came out of the wood pit and he just shook it off. What was that? That's the mighty power of God at work. Paul should have been dead, whether he realized it or not. But because of the doomness, because of the power, we realize, we see that a great nation, I should say nation, but a tribe was saved. Later that chief got saved as well. God used that powerful act to bring people to him. Now I'm going to start going a little bit faster for the sake of time. We can talk about um, Jesus when uh, the tax collector was saying to his disciples, is your master too good to pay taxes? And what did he tell Peter to do? Go down and catch a fish. And there was a coin in the fish's mouth. What was that? That was the dunamis. That was the power of the Holy Ghost. That was the power of God. What about Elijah when he's coming back or Elijah when he was going to be taken up? They come to the Jordan River. Both of them smack their mantle on the water and their water parts. But if we go back to the words of Elisha, right before he strikes the mantle, he made one great declaration. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? You know, that power does not, did not lie in just Elijah. That wasn't his own power. That wasn't his mind making the water split. That wasn't Elijah and his own being making the Jordan River split. That was the dunamis. That was the power of the Holy Ghost. There was a missionary to Mexico years ago in the Pentecostal Holiness Movement uh, by the name of Gail Myers. She was traveling through Mexico, I believe it was at the time, and she was dying of thirst. And when I say dying, I don't know. She just really needed a drink. I don't think she was on that drink. But she was exhausted. She was dehydrated. And she came across the puddle. And all she had was some pills that what you did was you took the water into the cup, you put the pills in it, and over time it would dissolve the water and make it clean to eat, to drink. What she did was, she was so dehydrated and thirsty, she said a prayer, she took a big gulp of the water in the mud puddle, and down those pill, two pills, whatever it was, and kept her own truck. We can talk about John G. D. Lake, down in, I believe, it was South Africa, when the plague was striking, breaking out. Nobody would bury the dead, but he rose up and buried the dead. And they all said, you're going to die the same plague that they have. He said, no, it won't. The disease die right on my hands. And when they put his hands under a microscope, they could literally watch the virus of the plague die and wither as it was on his hand. What is that? That is the dunamis. That is the power of the Holy Ghost. So how do we get the power of the Holy Ghost? Newsflash, we already have it if you believe. This power is given to every single one of them that believe. But how can we increase in the power? We can read our Bible every single day. We can pray. We can fast. We can strive to know God like never before. And that kind of ties in with fasting. When we fast, we show God that we are serious with Him. That we are getting down to the bare nitty gritty. God, not my will, not me, but your will be done. God, I want you to work through me. I don't want myself to take over it. Lord, take away the desires of my heart and give me the desires of your heart that you may use me more effectively. Lord, I don't want my flesh to get in the way. Let it be all of you and none of me. We need to learn to know the voice of God. John chapter 10 and verse 27, the Bible says, My sheep know my voice. We can look at Philippians chapter 3, oh, sorry, Acts 16, 6 through 10, which we're not going to turn there. But there we find Paul traveling. He desires to go to a certain location, but the Holy Ghost stops him and says, no, you can't go there. What is that? That's a man who knows the voice of God. And then later, he has a vision of the man of Macedonia. We refer to that as the Macedonian Paul. And Paul says, you know what, Lord? You want me to go to Macedonia? I will go to Macedonia. Macedonia. My sheep know my voice. Do you know God's voice? Do you know when He wants to act and work through you and use you? I'm not talking about the gifts, but there are people that God wants each one of us to reach. There are people that God wants us to show forth the dunamis or the mighty works and the mighty power of God. But sometimes before we can be used to a greater extent, we need to increase our own faith. What did the Bible say concerning he, uh, Stephen? He was full of power, but before that I mentioned something. 
He was full of faith. Do we have the faith that when God talks, God, are you going to do this? Or are you not going to do this? I know you said you're going to do this, but are you really going to do this? Because if you don't, I'm going to stand here looking like an idiot. <laughs> we need to increase, increase our faith. And how does faith come? Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing, and hearing comes by the Word of God. That is listening to the speaker. That is listening to the Sunday school teacher. That is listening to um, whether it be Bible or CD. That is listening to a good, completely doctrinally sound teacher, televangelist, whatever it is. I'm not knocking all of them, but there's a lot of bad ones out there too. But faith comes by hearing. How are we feeding ourselves? Are we, do we have CDs of other preachers that we know that are good just listening to them preach? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Are we reading the Bible more? We need to increase our faith. And then finally, when it comes down to it, the last thing that we have to do is we have to do it. We have to step out in faith and if God told us to do something. We need to do it. And sometimes God doesn't always have to tell us to do something. There are passages in the Bible that are promises of God. We've already talked about that this morning. It doesn't say that you have to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. We need to make it and agree it within ourselves that, you know what, God, I'm no longer going to sit on my hands. I'm not only going to, not just going to sit back from time to time. Lord, I'm not going to be a little bit more cautious of when I'm in my battles or whether I should do this. But Lord, I want to be a doer of your work. I am going to go forth. Not that we don't use wisdom. The Bible says that we need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But God expects His church to go out and do mighty miracles. But what for miracles are the current church of God doing? When was the last time in our own life we seen God work a mighty miracle through us? The Bible says that volumes could not contain all the things that Jesus did. And if we just go to that three and a half years of ministry, greater works than these shall you do. When was the last time we saw God do something mighty through us? When was the last time we saw something miraculous happen through us? Not because of who we are, because we need to keep in mind that we are nothing and that we need to rejoice that our salvation is written, our names are written down in heaven. That's the greatest. But if we talk about the promises of God and all the things that He expects us in the Great Commission, we cannot leave out the fact that He said, Greater things than these shall ye do. That's part of it. So what are we doing for the kingdom of God? We need to be out there showing the mighty power works. Because the devil's already out there performing mighty works. He's already winning over this generation. He's already showing them great signs and wonders. When was the last time the church did anything? When was the last time that the people can truly look at the church and say that truly only God could do such a thing? That had to be God. Nothing else, no one else can do anything like that. Not even the devil can come close. There was a, I believe it was a missionary one time. There's a, if I remember correctly, it was a witch doctor or a, a witch, something like that, warlock in the same town. And challenged that Christian to a duel. Let's see whose God is number one. So he met up with him the whole time the Christian was praying. I don't know what to do. God, put me in a direction. Tell me what to do. Well, he went out there and that man just started levitating. And you couldn't push him down. He just kept levitating. And that man didn't know what to do. He said, God, what am I supposed to do? And finally, he just, the man, the Christian just started yelling out, Jesus! That guy came down a little bit farther. He cried out, Jesus, again. And that man came down a little bit farther. And this kept on going until the man was finally on the ground. You know, we don't have to face that every single day to that capacity. But every day we're fighting the battle. Every day we're fighting the devil. Every day we're fighting in our community, in our homes, in our families. When was the last time? 
fact that we saw some dunamis come through us. Not because of who we are, but because of who he is. Because we need to win this world for God. Where's the church? And what are we doing? It's time that we get the dunamis back in the wall, in the church. Any thoughts, any questions at this point in time as we close? Amen, brother. Thank you for preaching God's word. God is good. Amen. Amen. If nothing else, let us bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels on the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move as it so desires for one. I pray, Lord, that that you just anoint the song leader and the musicians, Lord, as I praise you upon the string instruments, upon the vocal cords, Lord, that you give them a special blessing, anoint the pastor's mind and lips as he brings forth your word today, and give him a special blessing as well. And we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.